today's presentation on Joseph Wilkinson's diary of the siege of Fort Morgan. Thank you. So um, today's presentation will spotlight a document in our repository entitled The Diary of the Siege of Fort Morgan. This document is important in the story of Alabama's Civil War Battle of Mobile Bay and provides insight into the experiences of soldiers who served in the war. So during this presentation, we're going to look not only at the document and the man that wrote the document, but also a little bit of you know, genealogy and historical background about the siege and the fort and the battle. So I wanted to learn additional background information about the events Wilkinson wrote about, along with delving into the author's personal background. My research led me through military records, census records, newspapers, marriage records, and other documents to unearth details about Joseph Wilkinson's life and military service. Born in Louisiana in 1845, Joseph Biddle Wilkinson was the son of Dr. Joseph Biddle Wilkinson and Josephine Osborne Stark Wilkinson. He was third to carry the name Joseph Biddle Wilkinson and was the great grandson of Ann Biddle Wilkinson and General James Wilkinson who served in the Revolutionary War. Young Joseph Wilkinson briefly attended the Virginia Military Institute and entered the war at the age of 16 with the rank of first lieutenant. He was soon assigned to the 38th Mississippi Infantry Regiment and later transferred to artillery duty with the 21st Louisiana Infantry, where he served as adjutant. He was then transferred to the 1st Tennessee Artillery. Wilkinson's battalion was sent to Fort Morgan in early 1864, shortly after his marriage in Mobile to Miss Lydia Duval. He served at Fort Morgan through the Battle of Mobile Bay and the subsequent siege of the fort. Here are a few names that come up frequently in discussing the Battle of Mobile Bay. Admiral David Glasgow Farragut was in command of the Union Navy efforts to get past and defeat the three forts known as the Lower Bay Defenses, namely Fort Gaines, Fort Powell, and Fort Morgan. General Gordon Granger was in charge of Union land forces at Fort Gaines on Dauphin Island, as well as at Fort Morgan on Mobile Point. General Richard Lucian Page was in command of Confederate held Fort Morgan during the battle and subsequent siege. We now turn to the battle in Wilkinson's diary. The Battle of Mobile Bay was fought on August 5, 1864, when United States Admiral David G. Farragut and his fleet ran past Fort Morgan and entered Mobile Bay clashing with Confederate vessels led by Admiral Franklin Buchanan and ultimately winning the unequal naval engagement. Following the naval battle, Confederates abandoned and blew up Fort Powell at, at Grants Pass and quickly surrendered Fort Gaines on Dauphin Island, leaving only Fort Morgan on Mobile Point to hold out against federal land and naval forces. While Wilkinson entitled his 12-page narrative, The Diary of the Siege of Fort Morgan, he began his writings on August 5th with details of Farragut's fleet sailing into Mobile Bay and the naval battle that ensued. Here we have the first page of his diary, along with a typewritten page illustrating how documents such as this can be transcribed to make them easier to read. Here Wilkinson wrote, Heavy musketry fire firing at Fort Gaines about 5 a.m. On getting up at 6 a.m. saw Hartford and Brooklyn on right of the fleet. Thought something was up. Walked down to the fort. By the time I reached the parapet, the whole fleet were underway and streaming slowly up in the following order. Single turreted monitor in advance, double turreted next, then the Hartford and Brooklyn with double enders lashed to their port sides. The three masters and other gunboats lashed two and two following. Opened on the flagship about a mile. The enemy did not open till within three quarters when broadside after broadside jarred the very earth, though apparently that was the only trembling for our men stood nobly to their guns. The action grows more terrific and the fleet are within 200 yards of our batteries and abreast of the fort. 
our shot tear crashing through their sides, and now yells of triumph burst from the garrison. Then Wilkinson describes the greatest loss of life to occur during the battle, the sinking of the USS Tecumseh. The foremast under Tecumseh sinks to rise no more, a tomb for 106 corpses, four only escaping from death to our guardhouse, notwithstanding all our efforts, and no men could do more. The fleet passed by and steered for the western shore. As for the Confederate fleet, the morning saw the CSS gains sunk, the CSS Selma captured, and the ironclad CSS Tennessee left alone to fight the three remaining monitors and 17 men of war. Wilkinson wrote that the Tennessee fought nobly and did not surrender until the commander, Lieutenant James D. Johnston, was wounded, Admiral Franklin Buchanan had been critically injured, and the vessel's smokestack and steering gear had been cut away. The day's firing on the fort resulted in five of the guns being dismounted, but they were quickly returned to working order. The siege has commenced, wrote Wilkinson, and God only knows how long it will last, though in the end there can be no favorable result. Wilkinson lamented of Fort Morgan, the good of the service, I think, demands that we evacuate this fort, but for the moral of the thing, we have determined to hold out to the last. The next day, on August 6, Wilkinson wrote that Fort Powell had been evacuated and blown up the previous night, and noted the enemy was shelling Fort Gaines that evening. As for Fort Morgan, we have not been disturbed today. On August 7th, Wilkinson reported, a flag of truce was seen going in to the enemy from Fort Gaines today, signaled to them to know the cause of it and fired two guns to call attention. No reply being given, we have grave suspicions. I believe that they are negotiating for terms as the moral tone of the garrison is stated as being very bad. Fort Morgan's garrison was left unhindered as Wilkinson relayed, there are no firing today, and everything is as quiet as a Sunday evening on Royal Street in Mobile. The August 8th entry detailed the controversial surrender of Fort Gaines as witnessed from Fort Morgan. General Richard Page returned from Fort Gaines about 12 last night. He found that Colonel Anderson was aboard of the fleet negotiating terms, and fearing that he might have already surrendered, he returned leaving orders that when Colonel Anderson got back, he was to be sent over here under arrest. About 10 a.m. this instant, the enemy was reported marching into Fort Gaines, and by the time I reached the ramparts here, I saw our colors lowered. The men of Fort Gaines had, according to Wilkinson, surrendered without striking one blow for defense. Thus, he wrote, are we alone left to stem the tide and uphold the honor of our cause. On August 9th, Wilkinson wrote that Union transports had landed troops at nearby Navy Cove. Preparing for the inevitable onslaught against the fort, Confederates began to burn post buildings located outside of the fort. Two monitors and two or three gunboats opened a heavy fire on us, though only one man was slightly wounded. One shell entered my office, tore down one side, upset chairs, and splintered desks, and then lay down at our feet without bursting within three feet of me and several of us who were sitting around. Wilkinson wrote, Our escape was miraculous, for had that shell burst, these pages had been unwritten. They stopped firing about 2 p.m. and sent in a flag of truce demanding the unconditional and immediate surrender of the fort. Our reply can be easily guessed. They fired a few more 15-inch shot. We made every preparation tonight to meet an assault. And very weary and the garrison pretty well worn out. On August 10th, Wilkinson reported that one soldier had deserted the night before while a second man's unsuccessful attempt to desert landed him in the guardhouse. Wilkinson emphasized that the traitors who abandoned their posts did not reflect the metal of the vast portion of the garrison. Wilkinson described, Officers work with the men showing a good example and commendable spirit, 
In fact, there never was a better morale in any garrison and every man does his duties. Wilkinson and the men took advantage of the calm before the storm. We are much obliged to the enemy for being so quiet as we are allowed to go on peaceably with our work. On August 11th, Wilkinson acknowledged the work ahead would only get more difficult. So far, so good, though our time of trial has not yet come in its most trying form. Ourselves and the Yankees hard at work, they wrecking, we building. The single turreted monitor lying almost a mile from the wharf, I am glad she does not open on us, as to say the least, these 15-inch shells are annoying. Although they failed to cause any casualties, Union sharpshooters kept up a constant fire all day on the 12th. The enemy's battery is visible this morning, though no guns seemed as yet to have been planted. Every man must now put his shoulder to the wheel. Union forces move closer to the fort each day. The Yankee sharpshooters are on the edge of the parade ground, and some of them are just this side of the new hospital. They are very daring. Accounts of the siege were published in both northern and southern newspapers. The New York Times republished news updating the situation through August 11th, reporting that Farragut had demanded the unconditional surrender of Fort Morgan as Wilkinson had written. General Page's stated reply was that he had six months provisions, plenty of fighting men, and would resist to the last moment. The news article noted, before this, General Gordon Granger's force in the rear had cut off all the communications of the fort. On August 13th, the last of the buildings outside the fort were reduced to ashes before they could fall into Union hands. Sharpshooters maintain an energetic fire, sending their small projectiles whizzing all over the fort. Fort Morgan's garrison and the now Union-held ironclad Tennessee exchanged shots that afternoon, and Wilkinson noted that the fort's guns appeared to inflict little damage to the armored vessel. Later that evening, one of the double turreted monitors opened on us and sent her shells into the fort with remarkable precision and much to our annoyance. Captain Hughes was slightly wounded on the head. Cook, Company C, 7th or 1st, Alabama, very severely inside. Chapman, Company H, was severely wounded in hand and thigh by a mini ball. I am afraid they will not let us rest tonight. Wilkinson reported on August 14th that the bombardment of the night before had continued through 8 a.m. He wrote, Cook, Company B, 1st Tennessee, dreadfully wounded. Oops. Oh, yeah, that is, <laughs> pardon me, lost my spot there for a second. Um, Cook Company B, 1st Tennessee, wounded dreadfully in face. The casemates are not safe. The shells have no respect for them and roll in and out at pleasure. No desertions, though there have been 10 in the last five days. I hope we have now got rid of our bad stock. The land batteries and monitors opened on us this evening and are now shelling. Men hard at work, pleasant day otherwise. Union General Gordon Granger confirmed Wilkinson's notes about desertion when he reported, deserters, contrabands, and refugees from Fort Morgan, Mobile Point, and Mobile are arriving daily. On August 15th, Union forces continue firing on the fort night and day. We have inaugurated morning prayer meetings to take place at 6 a.m. at the Sally Port. One man while going to it this morning was struck dead by a fragment of a shell. Another shell, 15 inch, under Captain Johnson's flank casemate, dismounted two howitzers and burst wounding six men of Company A, 1st Tennessee. Last evening, our flag staff was shot away and a rifle 32 in the Lunette battery dismounted. The Yanks make it pretty hot for us in here, and no place is safe. We are in the hands of the Almighty, and may he be merciful to us. Wilkinson described sharpshooter fire as a perfect rain, and acknowledged no one can show his head above the parapet. The garrison had more to worry about than just sharpshooter fire. 
The greatest danger is from the falling and flying bricks when a shell strikes. They shower in every direction. Their land batteries are already battering our walls, and as there is some danger of our magazine being breached, we are destroying a portion of our powder, though we will retain about 60,000 pounds, enough to blow the fort to atoms should any accident to the magazine occur. Through all of this, General Page refused to give the order to return fire. I wish the general would let us open on their works, as it is a rather unpleasant thing to lie still and be shot at without even firing a shot, though it were useless. Those inside the fort were entirely cut off, and with 350 men hemmed in by a fleet of 40 vessels besides a large land force, confined in a small circle scarce large enough to drive a cart in, with a certainty of captivity and perhaps death before us. Resistance is heroism, and it is our unanimous resolve to sell this fort at a costly price. They outnumber us nearly 20 to 1. One 15-inch shell pierced the flank casemate of Company A, 1st Tennessee, and burst inside, but, unfortunately, but fortunately nobody was in at the time. On August 16th, Wilkinson gleefully wrote that the garrison was finally allowed to return their enemy's fire. We opened on the enemy's camp and works last night and continue firing nearly all night. They, of course, replied, and the balls moaned, shrieked, and whistled through the air. But Mr. Yank can't fire very accurately when somebody is shooting at him. It is a very fine thing to stand off coolly aim the gun as if at target practice, and fire at a parcel of poor devils cooped up in a pile of bricks when there is no danger in the way. But when both sides talk, Mr. Fed is rather nervous. We have found out one thing, and that is if our shot do no material damage, they lessen that done to us. Sharpshooter fire continued through one o'clock. Wilkinson described, they then opened on us from three different batteries, two of which have just been completed. Their fire was splendid until we opened and then the shots were rather wild. Wilkinson detailed the story of one soldier who met a swift and violent death during the day's bombardment. A sentry on the ramparts had his head and shoulders torn off by a parrot shell. The four, poor fellow cried, look out below for the shot that hurried him to eternity. The fort continued, continued to sustain damage as well. My casemate was struck two or three times, and if their firing is continuous, we must soon be breached. We will have a time of it before we get through with our defense. We all here are cheerful, that is most or seemingly so. The sharp shooting ceases at dark, and I have just been up on the parapet under cover of night to take a little fresh air and look around by the light of the moon. All is destruction without. Every building lies in ash, with the chimneys standing as relics of the past. As I am writing, the monitor is firing. As the shot went past, it seemed to carry the atmosphere on its course. The noise of a 15-inch firecracker is not the softest music imaginable. On August 6, 17th, Wilkinson reported that the fort fired at the surrounding Union troops from 9.30 p.m. until midnight. Yanks commenced firing from their bats this evening. A private company, A, 1st Tennessee, wounded on post in 10 places by the bursting of a shell, will probably terminate fatally as the piece of shell can't be extracted. Wilkinson wrote on August 18th that the enemy was industriously engaged in digging trenches and positioning their guns. Some firing this morning and evening, but the enemy are so hard at work that they have given us snatches of quiet. Their rifle pits are within 700 yards and one battery in the east about 800 yards. The others are about a mile distant. Wilkinson acknowledged the close quarters inside the fort, writing, "'Tis hard to endure our imprisonment, but as no better awaits us, we are content to remain for the credit of the thing. "'Tis about bedtime. I will close." Here, the diary of Lieutenant Wilkinson ends abruptly as Union efforts to force the fort's surrender intensified. 
while he clearly had more pressing matters to attend to during the siege than writing his observations. It is unfortunate that Wilkinson did not conclude his account after the war. Looking at other primary documentation helps to complete the picture of the siege in its entirety. Union Naval Commander David Dixon Porter wrote a detailed account of the final days of the siege. Following General Granger's notification that his guns would be ready to move on the fort the following morning, Farragut ordered his fleet to stand by and move into position to bombard the fort at daybreak on August 22nd. No hotter bombardment was ever kept up for 24 hours, recounted Porter. Union shelling had compri compri compromised <laughs> The casemates, endangering the company quarters and placing the men inside them at the risk of being crushed should a shell strike the wrong area. At half past 8 p.m., the citadel of the fort burst out in flames, adding its bright light to the grandeur of the scene and illuminating the bay where the cannon of the fleet, directed by practiced hands, were belching forth their deadly missiles, which sped on their destructive way unerringly. When the fire broke out, General Granger ordered the rear batteries to redouble their fire. At 6 a.m. on the 23rd, an explosion took place inside the enemy's work. General Page reported to General Dabney Murray on August 23rd, I held the fort as long as it was tenable. The parallels on the, of the enemy had reached the glossy. The walls were breached. All the guns save two were disabled. The woodwork of the citadel being repeatedly fired by the shells of the enemy endangered the magazines. All my powder was destroyed. Every gun effectually spiked and otherwise damaged, and indeed the whole fort, everything that could prove of value to the enemy, is now a mass of debris. I turned this over to their forces at two o'clock today. The garrison behaved gallantly and gained honor for themselves and country. On August 28th, Private Brother was able to view the inside of Fort Morgan and see the damages that were sustained. Nearly all the guns are dismounted, he wrote. The carriages have been knocked to pieces by our shot and shell. Pieces of our shell were lying all around and some had exploded. A fire still burned inside where the stores had been kept. In many places, the brick walls have been pierced through and through. The fort is, in fact, pretty well used up, and a good deal of time and labor will be needed to set it right again. Brother's assessment of the damages was accurate, as post-siege photos such as the ones you see here illustrate. Service records show that Wilkinson was taken prisoner when General Page surrendered Fort Morgan. Following the surrender of the fort, he was taken to New Orleans. Wilkinson reportedly cut through a brick wall in order to escape along with other officers and rejoin the army. He continued in the Confederate service through the end of the war. Following the war, census records for 1870 show us that Joseph Wilkinson returned to Louisiana where he was employed in the family sugar business. He and his wife, Lydia, are listed as having three children are shown living in the house with his parents and a number of his siblings. His occupation is noted as manager of sugar plant. The 1880 census shows Wilkinson and his wife and children continuing to live in Louisiana with his parents. His occupation is listed as overseer or manager. By 1889, Joseph Wilkinson was working as associate editor of the New Orleans Daily City Item. He was appointed to serve on the Board of General Appraisers by President Harrison in 1890, having previously served as a clerk in the appraiser's office of the New Orleans Custom House. The 1890 census was destroyed by fire, so the next census we see him on is in 1900. This census shows him living in Manhattan, New York, with his wife, Lydia, and three of his grown children. His occupation is listed as lawyer. One of his obituaries notes he worked as a customs attorney after his government appointment with the Board of Appraisers ended. 
According to one obituary, Wilkinson was aware his health was failing, which led him to return to Louisiana, where he died on October 23, 1915. He passed away at Myrtle Grove Plantation and was interred in the Army of Tennessee tomb in Matari Cemetery. Here you can see an obituary from newspapers.com along with his listing on findagrave.com. His find a grave entry includes a transcription of a longer, more detailed obituary that appeared in a Louisiana paper. Find a grave entries often include pictures of the grave site, images of the deceased, obituaries, and leads to other relatives. Following the Battle of Mobile Bay, Fort Morgan was occupied by Union troops and later used by U.S. forces during World War I and World War II. The concrete batteries, such as the one in the photo to the left, were added to coastal fortifications such as Fort Morgan in an effort to update them for use in case of enemy attack by water. There were no battles at Fort Morgan during this period, but the site was used for training troops and monitoring the coastal waters. Visitors to the fort today can see areas where bricks have been replaced and walls were patched. The interior of the fort is now empty as the remains of the citadel were torn down. Concrete pads note the position of the old cisterns that the powder was emptied into. The August heat that visitors experience calls to mind the distant past when soldiers were bottled up within the fort walls while a fire raged in their midst and shells rained down with annoying frequency. Together, these accounts of the battle tell a behind-the-scenes story of soldiers' experience living through the Battle of Mobile Bay and subsequent siege. If you are interested in learning more, some of the sources I found useful in my research include the ADAH digital collections on our website, Fold3.com Civil War Service Records Collections, Newspapers.com, which is a subscription website we make available for free to patrons who visit the research room, and for general context regarding the Battle of Mobile Bay, there is the book West Wind, Flood, Tide, The Battle of Mobile Bay by Jack Friend, and of course, one of the best Civil War research sources can be found in the ORs, or the volumes of the War of the Rebellion. If you are interested in learning more about your ancestors' Civil War service and don't have time to search for records yourself, feel free to submit a research request and we will do it for you. One of our research archivists will go through files in our collections, Fold3 and Ancestry.com, to give you a full look at available records for your ancestor service. You never know what you will find. The number of documents and amount of information we can provide will depend on how long your ancestors served and how many of the records were created and or survived the war. This wraps up today's research rundown presentation. If anyone has questions, please put those in the comments and we will be glad to answer a few before we go. You can also email me at kayla.scott at archives.alabama.gov. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Kayla mentioned, if you have a question for her, please feel free to put it in the comments. I will be able to get to it during our Q&A right now. Uh, but to start off, Kayla, I'm, I'm interested to learn more about um, the desertions that were in uh, Wilkinson's diary. Can you tell us how common were those kinds of desertions, especially uh, in uh, Mobile Bay? Mobile Bay? So, I mean, they're con they're common throughout the war in a number of contexts. Uh, desertion, evasion of service, it's not um, uncommon whatsoever. But the isolation of Fort Morgan lent itself, um, especially during the battle and the time leading up to the battle. Mm -hmm. And you would think being a mobile point that it would be really difficult to get away, but some did manage. And uh, one in particular, uh, his name was John S. Jacobson, and in the official record of the War of the Rebellion, there is this extremely long report where if there had been a kitchen sink, he would have described it in detail down to the last, like, the color and the size and the maker and everything. But, of course, there wasn't a kitchen sink, but he would have if he could have. 
because he describes all three forts in Lower Bay defenses. He tells who's in command, how many troops are there. He tells where the uh, armory was in Mobile. Mm -hmm. He talks about their rations and their water sources. And he goes through this such a huge long list. It's like, I mean, he didn't leave anything out. And it's fascinating because you think, okay, someone deserts, maybe they just, you know, skitter away to Mobile and you never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. But you had ones that were being intentionally going to enemy lines or being picked up on by enemy lines. Mm -hmm. And then they would give these wonderful reports that literally said like, you know, hey, here's the strength. You should just go ahead and attack them. <laughs> But then today for us, we can have that as a great record to going back to being able to see in great detail, you know, their experiences, but also what they saw around them. Exactly. Because um, that, to me, that particular um, letter or that report that was made based on the soldier Jacobson's um, memory of everything that he had seen and um how he understood supply lines to be operating that's fascinating in a number of levels because mm -hmm. it helps you put different pieces together along with other reports as to what was going on how many men there really were and and i mean he there were a few things that he was a little you know incorrect about but he was close enough that there were some definitely would have been some issues caused by, yeah. by that little leak <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it's, it's great for us now that we're able to kind of go back and see that. So now you've done a lot of kind of looking at, you know, the Battle of Mobile Bay at large. What do you think is the most overlooked detail or part of that battle that you'd like to make sure people are aware of? Two things, really. Um, one would be Fort Powell, that mm -hmm. Fort Powell existed. Because you have Fort Morgan and Gaines and their masonry third system fortifications. And then you had Fort Powell that was an unfinished sand fortification. And so when Williams, the commander at that fort, blew it up, there was, I mean, there was a, a sand pile left behind. And there were guns and different things that managed to survive the explosion. But over time, with all the hurricanes and the tides changing, you cannot see where that fort was located anymore. And so mm -hmm. there's not that physical reminder. You can't take your kids and go on vacation and see Fort Powell. So there have been a lot of times that I've been talking about some aspect of this and with friends or different people and they'll be like, Fort Powell, I never heard of Fort Powell. So that's fascinating to me that that's one of the things that's overlooked in kind of current interpretation a lot of times, but also in historical interpretation. It's often not mentioned in great detail in some sources because it was kind of, it was unfinished. There was a smaller group of men there and they just kind of write it off. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing would be the siege of Fort Morgan because a lot of people that have done research, um, Jack Friend is one of them. They mm -hmm. either mention, do like him and they mention two sentences that say the siege happened. Um, they don't go into the details about how Page, that uh, citadel catching on fire and, you know, the siege was prolonged. It was several days. And then the citadel catching on fire is what really tip, was the tipping point of they can't exist inside this fort mm -hmm. any longer because they have all of this powder and the heats, you know, they're bottled up in there. And so it's a really key point to understanding just, you know, what went on to the Battle of Mobile Bay to understand that there was a siege and also the, the events that took place surrounding it that led to the surrender being exactly when it was. Thank you so much. One last uh, little thing. I'm sure you might have mentioned it, so I'm sorry if it's a repetition, but sure. if uh, people are interested in reading the diary itself, has it been part uh, added to our digital collections or is it something they would need to come in person to be able to see? 
It is in digital collections. It's under textual materials. So um, it's very, very clear, very um, excellent resolution. His mm -hmm. handwriting, as you can see from the PowerPoint, is a little lacking in some cases, but, um, but it is online for anyone that wishes to view it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for highlighting this amazing resource that we have here at the archives and for showing everybody a little bit about how they can use it in their own research. If you down the line have any questions for Kayla, she gave you her contact information at the end there. And I know she's always happy to help field any research questions. So thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you again on April 18th uh, for our Food for Thought as Mike Bunn will present on uh, Fort Blakely and Mobile, Mobile's last stand there as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.